let's get going here. And um, it is just great to be with you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of completing today a module that we started last time. Um, and this module focuses on one of these areas of um, greatest, greatest practical importance, greatest um, sort of attention, um, greatest significance for issues of modeling equity related concerns um, uh, and, and, and disparities uh, in the population, which flies in the area of, of heterogeneity. Um, and you may recall that last time uh, from this floor, uh, I spoke with you uh, about capturing heterogeneity of a static sort. Um, so that that heterogeneity was in um, in terms of uh, characteristics of a person that were um, weren't changing. And uh, one of the things we we saw, and maybe I'll you know share my screen so you can um, you can sort of jointly talk about this together is while while there's several different ways of 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 capturing heterogeneity and aggregate stock and flow modeling and in individual level modeling or agent based modeling um those two have very different uh ways of representing a model very different organizations of the model and stock and flow model to modeling to capture distinctions um distinctions statically and it turns out distinctions dynamically we divide people up into to different stocks so we might have susceptible men susceptible women exposed men exposed women for example if you want to keep track of the number of infections occurring in men uh, versus women um in age-based modeling by contrast we organize the model as it runs into individuals and each keeps track of their characteristics um, and so you know each person in the population keeps track of the states that it's in the its characteristics in terms of say income or or, or um, you know education level or province of birth or, or current province or what have you um uh we're not dividing up people in the model into different kind of bins and counting the number of people with certain characteristics rather each person keeps keeps track of it themselves and i, I kind of analogize this to having you know a grouping of objects which um we could summarize in a table as sort of a count of, of different combinations. It's kind of analogous to, to the sort of idea of putting things in bins and counting the number that fall into each bin. Um, or, or we could you know, just keep track of each of these items um, not try to collapse them into to these equivalence classes and and keep track of its characteristics. And well, I didn't go through it um, uh, in in detail yesterday. It turns out that that um, if you have enough heterogeneity, and it doesn't take many types or many many divisions within those those limited types for it to actually end up being more efficient in terms of storing the information to keep track of it this way rather than keeping track of the counts. Basically, once you start getting enough different things, you know, sh here, shape, color, but once you start, you know, uh, you start to keep track, need to keep track additionally of size, for example, or border color or what have you. Or once each of these categories like color has many different possible values, it turns out the combinatorics of it, the sort of set of all combinations to list them out and count each one it ends up becoming um, truly voluminous and, and many of them may be zero. Within these coupled models, as we'll see, you know, what it explores in terms of all possible states is often a small part of what it could explore. So you end up having lots and lots of kind of zeros in a big table. And it, at some point it becomes actually more favorable just from information storage to kind of keep track of each one. And, and not have to worry about kind of bookkeeping it into a into a table. So that was kind of one 
motivation I gave last time. But it turns out that there's lots of other trade-offs uh, beyond this that, that end up uh, applying. And one of them I, I argued about last time was um, model transparency. We'll be seeing more about that today. Another one was nimbleness of model evolution. That as we add more distinctions into a model, more types of heterogeneity, um, if, if we keep track of it as kind of individuals, a collection of individuals, it turns out that that's much more scalable. It's, it's much easier to keep track of. Scalable is not the right word there, but it's, it's much easier to keep track of that. Um, um, you know, or if you could think of it as each person, the population just has an additional attribute, their education, or they have an additional attribute, their birth weight, or their, their you know, their um, uh, province of birth, or what have you, country of birth. And rather than sort of go and subdivide the entire model up to, to make distinctions between things, uh, which ends up being very a very global operation, something that it gets you involved with all sorts of different areas of the model, forces you to modify lots and lots, you know, adding bits of information in or removing them to an individual level model is a lightweight operation. We'll come back to those points today. Um, but last time we, we talked about this issue of, um, of static heterogeneity, and I argued at the end, it doesn't come for free, you know, keep a track of each individual in the population, each of these people here in this network here, um, oh, in this network, say, uh, rather than just counting the number in these states, has a cost. It has a performance cost. If we double the size of the population, we have to keep track of twice as much information. We have to we have at least double the memory. And at least double the processing time in a naive implementation. Um, so um, so it, it turns out that, you know, in terms of keeping track of static heterogeneity, you know, adding in more types of heterogeneity makes stock and flow models, aggregate stock and flow models, slower and bigger and more ungainly. We'll come back to that. Um, but, but it's, it's fairly easily, fairly surgical within individual based models. But if we increase the population size, that's expensive for individual level models, but doesn't affect our running time at all with, with an aggregate model, aggregate stock flow model. If we double the size of the numbers in, of, of, of the people in each of these categories. It's just a bigger number, which is computing with a bigger number. And typically that's gonna make no difference in computing time. It's gonna be just as fast. Um, whether it's you're dealing with millions of people in each of these states or with tens of people, uh, it's gonna be just as fast. The accurate, the, the sort of the groundedness of the simulation or the accuracy, the, the ability to capture the relevant dynamics may be very different at a small, small scale than a very large scale, but you know, there's really no scaling in, in kind of performance. So that was last time, static heterogeneity. This time we're completing the module by talking about a different sort of heterogeneity, dynamic heterogeneity. Um, and I'm hoping that this lecture may expose you to some new thinking, but will reinforce much of what we saw last time, because the ideas here uh, have a lot of linkages to what we saw last time. So let's let's go jump into that if we could. Um, so here we go. Um, so and and you know I I stand to be criticized because I. I'd love to, I, I should have gotten these slides up there and I apologize, I will get them posted as soon as we're done with the, the lecture. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about heterogeneity in terms of state representation, I a fancy word, but what I'm talking about is heterogeneity, differences between people in terms of where they are at certain processes that affect them. So maybe we have a person that you know, is progressing along, uh, they, they have early stage diabetes. Um, maybe they haven't yet developed heart disease, but as a diabetic, they're at worst risk of developing it. Maybe they have a certain chance of kidney disease and they're at early stage kidney disease. 
uh, they could progress in terms of retinopathy, another complication that can occur, particularly with uncontrolled diabetes. Um, or maybe we want to keep track of, you know, COVID-19 and flu, and we have someone as susceptible to flu, um, but has, or has, has been exposed and is lately infected with COVID-19. We, we have these different areas where people can progress in their state, their underlying situation. And we want to reason about that with respect to multiple conditions. It turns out that type of heterogeneity is, aware, is one where, where what, you know, the advantages of, of, of individual level modeling are arguably even greater because we can keep track of history, et cetera. Um, so we, we talked about the differences in, in organization here of stock and flow models and, and aggregate models. And, and that's a theme that, to which we're gonna come back. Um, but much of today's lecture is gonna be talked about this issue of representing the state of individuals. And I'm gonna privilege in this lecture um, not for any deeply good reason, but just because I think it's um, more accessible, um, a lot of discussion on one way of depicting states in an agent-based model, and that is with state charts. Um, uh, and we're gonna be using state charts um, as a tool for illustrating um, at once, the possible states an agent can be in with respect to you know, particular condition. Um, so in this case, they could be susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. The sets of actions that can change them from one, of the, from one state to another, these transitions in the rules that govern those actions as indicated by, you know, and, and sort of uh, abstracted by, by these icons that we'll dive down to. So state charts give us all at once that in a, in a visually, uh, a visually parsable uh, fashion, a little bit like a stock and flow diagram gives us possible states, the actions that can change the states. And if you look at the formulas for the flows, the, the, the rules that govern those actions. Um, now, for a simple state chart, a person, an agent is going to be in, in one state at a time. Uh, we'll get into hierarchical state charts in a bit. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's you know, these transitions, which are predefined and, and fixed, which by fixed, I mean they're, they're predefined. They, the existence of a transition doesn't appear and disappear um, over time. Um, which can lead them from one state to another. This isn't the only type of state representation. And at the end of this lecture, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go into um, some additional representations and, and hark back to some of the models that we, we visited. But you know, I wanna pursue in some of this lecture a question which I've gotten before and which students have asked about a, on a couple occasions which concerns the kind of relationship between two, two representations of state, the actions that change it in rules. On the one hand, a stock and flow model over here, um, and on the other, a, a, a state chart um, over there on the left. Uh, I mean, at a certain level, these seem like maybe they're just potato, potato, tomato, tomato, that, you know, just different ways of showing visually the same information. You know, we have susceptible, susceptible, exposed, exposed, infectious, infectious, recovered, recovered for the states. And we have transitions between them, including waning of immunity. So is there any real essential difference between these? Um, is this kind of isomorphism between them? It, is that indicative of a real difference? And and the answer is yes, there is a real difference. There are threads of similarity and we shouldn't lose track of that, but um, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show state charts um, have a, a very different, have very different implications as one adds in multiple concerns into a model, um, adds in heterogeneity as well. Um, 
Uh, and uh, we'll see that that state charts do allow us to describe the sort of things we can at an aggregate level with stock and flow model, but it can do so um, uh, in in additionally flexible ways at at multiple on on multiple fronts, including um, non-memory list transitions. That's a that's a mouthful, but transitions where it really depends how long you've been in a state. Maybe your chance of, of falling back to being a smoker depends how long you've been a former smoker, for example. Um, uh, but it also matters in terms of scaling for multiple types of heterogeneity. Okay, so let's, let, let, let's talk uh, about these state charts in a little bit more detail. And I want to hit on them because I really think in today's environment, they can be very valuable for transparent modeling to help bring out those critiques, which are so central to modeling, those suggestions from diverse stakeholders. So we're going to talk about uh, transitions in any logic, not because they are the, the only focus of the course, by no means, but I think they're emblematic of a lot of options for characterizing uh, dynamics among discrete states, categorical states, nominal states, set of possible states you can be in, which is discrete. We can count it up, uh, and and uh, where you know those dynamics play out over time in different ways. One is a timeout transition. This is very common in in Asian-based modeling. You spend a certain amount of time in a given state. So maybe I'm infected and I recover you know, five days after I get infected, let's say, um, or after my symptoms disappear after five days. Um, uh, another is a, a fixed rate. And for those more familiar with um, biostatistics, I, you know, appeal to the notion of a hazard rate, a chance per unit time, a probability per unit time, not just a probability, but a probability per unit time um, of leaving a state. Um, so maybe I have a 10% chance per day of leaving that state in a continuous time framework, for example. So my chance of remaining in that state goes down over time. As days T go up, it goes down as the exponent of minus uh, alpha T, where alpha is point, point 0.1, for those for whom that you're comfortable thinking about that. Um, a variable rate. Um, um, is is a common one. Um, so again, maybe my chance of relapsing into smoking depends how long I've been quit, um, and uh, and and therefore I have a chance of leaving at any one time, but it's changing based on how long I've been there. My chance of recovery maybe from uh, on a per day basis from TB changes depend on how long I've had it. And maybe it, it worsens because I develop worse forms of TB if I if I have it for longer. So there's competing risks. Um, a message transition, and again, this transcends any logic, but you know where we have agents communicating with messages. This will be a central theme uh, shortly within our lectures. But uh, interagent interactions via messages is one of the most common ways. Uh, a predicate transition, so. I transition when something occurs and, and when I reach a, a location in mobility as I'm moving around. Um, and it turns out transitions can be kind of routed with, with, um, uh, with branches. So, um, you know, within uh, any logic, we have these kind of visual depictions that know what, what, broad class of transitions we have. They don't distinguish fixed versus variable rate transitions, but a rate transition is shown over here to the right. Unfortunately, the little handle obscures kind of an exponential curve there. You'll see it in some other slides, but over here on the left is a timeout transition. Okay. Um, and um, and those have, have very different implications. Um, so, so rates are, for someone who's done compartmental modeling or system dynamics modeling or stock and flow modeling and other forms, um, rate transitions should be quite familiar. Um, 
uh, we see them within um, within a, a diagram like this, like a recovery delay. So maybe I, you know, I tend to remain infectious for ten days on average. So on a per day chance, we we treat this as memoryless. So per day chance, I flip a coin with a ten percent chance I recover. So the formula for new recovery here will be the number of people in the in this stock or compartment or state variable, whatever your name for it, divided by the recovery delay. And and that's a that's a model of kind of a memoryless transition process. It doesn't matter how long I've been in the state I, um, my chance of leaving per unit time is the same. Um, in short, this is kind of the the unit of of homogeneity in the model. Um, if I want to capture a memory full process, I might divide this into I1, I2, I3 in a row. But, but in a stock and flow model, I, I will often have a rate transition. And similarly, maybe I'll have a, you know, a, a waning immunity transition. Sometimes it's formulated as a rate, like this uh, rate over here for new infections, which is in fact, uh, the per susceptible infection rate is called the force of infection. Okay, um, so this is the rate, the rate type of transition we have, um, this sort of fixed rate or variable rate um, is very similar to what we have in compartmental modeling, rate transition. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, basically it's, it's the same idea here, except it needn't be memoryless, and, and we'll come back to that. Um, so with fixed rates, we have these transition hazards, and we're dealing with this chance uh, uh, an individual and individual transitions. So we don't have to multiply by a number of people at risk. You know, um, here we're we're dealing with a single person who's going, say, from exposed to infectious with a certain chance per day. Um, in a stock and flow model, you know, the the formula for this would be infectious divided by mean time infectious because each of these people you know, has a chance of transition. If there's a billion people in the infectious state versus 10 people, it'll make a big difference for the number of people going here. Here, we're dealing with a single individual. We're dealing with a chance per unit time that they will transition. So we just specified the rate, you know, probably 10% per day. And if it's 10% per day, they'll remain here for an average of 10 time units. If it's 50% per day, they'll remain here an average of two time units. In other words, the, 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 the dwell time here for a fixed rate is, the average dwell time is one over that fixed rate, the reciprocal of that fixed rate. Um, okay. Um, so, so here we, we have with stock and flow model, something that kind of is similar to what we have here. It's kind of an individual level, um, uh, individual level analog to it, you can think. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, but in these rates can change over time. Now in a compartmental model, we can have changing rates. I mean, a classic example here is this force of infection, right? Like if I'm susceptible, my chance of getting infected per unit time over the next day is of course likely to change. Um, it, it depends how many people out there are infected, right? Um, if there's nobody infected out there, I have no chance of becoming infected. If there's a billion people infected out there, I have a higher chance of getting infected. So obviously my chance per day of getting infected as a susceptible will depend on, you know, will change over time. It will depend on the state of the model. Um, but what is not variable here is, is it depending on how long ago I came into this stock S. Um, in compartmental modeling in its classic form, and I'm putting aside things like conveyors, ovens, and so on in system dynamics modeling, which have, you know, added additional richness here. Um, um, some of my colleagues, uh, Mark Heffernan, is makes a very strong use of, for example, of conveyors extensively. Um, 
perhaps uh, even more so than, than regular stocks. But in classic form here, this is a unit of homogeneity. In other words, we don't distinguish how long ago someone came into, say, the infectious stock or the susceptible stock to judge when they're going to leave. Their chance of leaving could depend over time, but not on how long they've been in that compartment, how long ago they, they came into that compartment. Okay. Um, another type of transition, though, I want to talk about uh, is a fixed duration, um, fixed duration um, uh, timeout. And I want to I want to distinguish um, this. This is a very simple conceptual model, but it's 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 simple in a different way than the simplicity you see with a rate transition. And you know I should. Um, I'm feeling hampered here, and I'm I'm tempted to use the board uh, here. Um, but before I do that, before I take the step of doing that, I'm just going to check marker acceptability, and and I find the markers are worthy. So I'm going to turn for those remotely. I'm going to turn this um, uh, this uh, view in hopes that you can see the board. And let's let's see how. Let's see if we can keep this connected. Okay, this is going to be it's going to be a little bit tricky, but there's there's the board. Okay, um, it's a bit of glare, but hopefully that won't be uh, debilitating. Okay, so that's where the glare is. Um, maybe we can adjust it a little bit more. Okay, um, and for those in the room, I will um, I will uh, try to trying to uh, get this so you can see it too. So in a transition, which is a rate transition, no matter how long, if this is the amount of time that we have been time in state, I'm talking in a state chart, this is the amount of time we've been in the state. How does the chance per unit time, if I have a fixed transition rate, how does this change over time? It's a bit of a trick question. How does that change over time? It's a fixed transition change. If I'm still in the state at a given time, if I'm still in here at, at different times, you know, after one month, after two months, how does it change if it's a fixed rate? It doesn't. It's constant. Yeah. It doesn't change at all. So it's fixed, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see that. It, it looks horrible. And um, if... Okay, this this doesn't look much less horrible. So um, I think we're we're dealing with uh, impaired uh, writing instruments. Maybe this will be a little bit better. But there's an orange line that's constant there. Maybe you can see as I draw it better than you can see it on the board. Um, uh, ah, okay. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so it's fixed as the longer I spend in the state, conditional on me still being in the state, it's the same amount of, you know, it's the same chance per unit time of leaving. Conditional of me having been there for, you know, um, still having, you know, active TB for another day, maybe my, we assume for the fixed transition, my chance of recovering is the same no matter how many days I've had it. So each successive day, if I haven't recovered yet, I have that same chance per unit time of recovering. By contrast, what does a timeout transition look like in terms of this chance of leaving? If, if this is my chance of leaving, uh, chance, uh, so per day, uh, chance uh, or probability of leaving, you know, probability uh, of departing, um, how does that change? Uh, for a, a, a fixed, uh, a timeout transition, a fixed length transition, a transition that is only fires after exactly some amount. Can anyone say? What does it look like? What is it before that time? So let's suppose it's a timeout of 10 days. So it's assumed that after 10 days, I will recover from COVID-19 symptoms, let's suppose. Exactly 10 days. What's the chance of me leaving in day zero? Zero. Zero. What's the chance of me leaving in day one? Zero. 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 And then 
I am sure to leave at exactly day 10, right? So this is what's called for those from mathematical backgrounds called a Dirac Delta function. I could draw it up here, but no matter how high I go, it, 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 I can't draw the full extent of it. But this is a, a function. This is actually, it's not technically a function. Um, it's, uh, but it, it kind of serves that purpose and it has probability mass one. Like it occurs at exactly that time, but it's super spiky. And so, you know, if uh, it's over a very, very short time, but it's extremely likely and you take the limit of it and essentially you are sure to leave after exactly 10 days, let's say. So this is a very different, these are two simple models. One assumes I don't care at all how long I've been in this state. Um, uh, I have the same chance, same kick at the can every day, same chance of leaving every day. The other says, I care entirely about how long I've been in the state. I will leave it after exactly this amount of time. Both are very conceptually simple, but they're simple in different ways. And this is for a timeout transition. So this would be for a timeout transition, the Dirac Delta function um, or impulse function. And this is for a rate, a fixed rate transition. Um, uh, and these are you know, two different ways of capturing the, um, uh, the, the dynamics that are quite common. They're, they're arguably the most common ways of, of capturing this. Uh, both, as I said, are simple, but they're simple in different ways. Now, um, uh, the ways in which we use them are often um, more flexible than this would suggest. So, um, if this were our only repertoire, you know, we could still do quite a bit of good modeling. After all, within um, within stock and flow modeling, we essentially have classic stock and flow modeling. We have rates that are independent of how long you've been in the state. They can change over time, overall secular progress of time, but not, not based on how long you've been in the state. But you could still have quite a repertoire. But Within, within agent-based modeling, commonly we will do things like, number one, have compute an amount of time I've actually been in this state and adjust this rate of leaving based on how long I've been in the state. So again, if I've been quit smoking for a year, I'm much less likely to fall back into smoking in the next day than I was you know, after my first day of, of having quit. Um, it's much more likely in my first day of quitting, I'll fall back in the next day than it would be after a year of being quit. So we can do that. We can have it depend on how long I've been quit. But uh, we can also um, we can also with the timeout transition draw how long it is until I will leave from an arbitrary distribution. So we could draw for the timeout from a gamma distribution or a beta distribution or log normal distribution, the amount of time it will take me to leave and set that to be the timeout. The timeout doesn't have to be a fixed number specified when you specify the model. It can be a number determined um, as the model is running, such as by drawing it from a distribution, an arbitrary distribution. And this gives us tremendous tremendously broader repertoire. It lets us represent factors that are quite a departure from sort of the memoryless uh, strictures that uh, are, are most classically with us for um, for stock and flow, uh, for classic stock and flow models. Um, okay, so, um, uh, you know, we might have, um, uh, fixed timeouts for some things, but often we will draw it from, from a distribution. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, in any logic, I won't get into this, but it turns out that, you know, you can have it recalculate these chances per unit time, these hazard rates by leaving and, and coming back into a state where we'll, we'll recalculate that. Um, and uh, this is something which, you know, it's well described in some of my videos, including 
in that playlist I posted on the course site. Um, uh, and we may come back to this if time allows uh, at the end of class in terms of me um, best supporting your needs in this area. Um, but I wanna talk about some other features of, uh, of modeling with, with state charts that I, um, you know, I think are worth noting. So one thing is that we'll commonly have conditional transitions between states. So maybe I'm exposed to pathogen um, and I have a lower chance of, of getting infected if I'm wearing a mask or if there's good ventilation like there is here, or if I'm, um, you know, if, if I have a high level of pre-existing antibodies um, uh, or, you know, if, if uh, it's in a situation where uh, we have uh, we have the other person being masked, et cetera. So here we might have exposure event, but then a conditional event on whether or not someone is infected. Um, there might be other transitions in this model of, of TB. Um, uh, for example, there's a question then, do they go on to primary progression to kind of immediate TB, developing active TB disease after getting affected, or do they go into a state of, of, um, of latent uh, infection? Um, and, uh, and that's LTBI, latent TB infection. Um, so this question, you know, do they undergo primary progression? Do they develop active TB right away? Or does it just sit in them, say within granulomas in a way that might pop out when during stress, stressful life situations later, or when their immune system is weak for other regions, reasons, or when they're suffering from another life uh, sort of health challenge, et cetera. Um, um, and finally, I'll, I'll just note that, um, you know, often in state charts, you'll have these sort of sync states, these states which represent endpoints. And um, it turns out that, um, it often makes sense to share these between multiple state charts. So for example, death is the most common one. So this is the death star. Um, and, uh, and people can, uh, can transition now. Um, okay. Um, okay, so this, this difference between state charts and, and stock and flow models that we've been talking about, I, you know, I've brought out some texture here. I've said, well, look, um, in state charts, um, we, we have a structure which may mirror a stock and flow model as, as a whole, but we have some added repertoire. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, rate transitions where that rate can change based on how long I've been in a given state, the state whence that rate rate originates from which the rate is 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 uh, the transition with the rate is headed um i can also have uh, a timeout transition where i draw the time in that state from an arbitrary distribution and there's no question that that adds repertoire um there's other types of transitions uh, that that are added to this, which I haven't covered, but uh, which are a little bit more, um, I think, less you know intellectually deep. Uh, but but that's uh, to be argued. Um, for example, a predicate transition uh, that that says I I go when a certain condition has been met elsewhere in the model, a certain state has been achieved, or or what have you. Um, an arrival transition is quite significant, you know, having to do with mobility. Like I'm, I, I'm traveling from A to B, and when I arrive at B, I trigger something happening. I, you know, when I arrive at the physician's office, I check in um, or what have you. Um, a message received transition, this will end up being central to our modes of agent-agent interaction. And those two can govern you know, the dynamics of progression here in ways that are, are rather distinct from what we do in stock and flow models. Um, so I, I hope I've highlighted some similarities to stock and flow models that, you know, 
this reasoning about hazard rates, for example, um, but also some differences there. But the truth is I haven't talked about one of the areas where, one of the most impactful areas where these two are different and which, which harks back to our discussion last time, okay? Um, uh, about heterogeneity. Um, uh, so stock, stock and flow um, uh, and, and, and state charts, we're going to be considering this third point here. And considering um, in a state chart, our progress along distinct axes, distinct concerns, distinct flows, such as multiple, what are called comorbid conditions, um, multiple lines of development, um, we're gonna have a very different way of representing this, okay? Um, so let's consider COVID and influenza, okay? Um, uh, uh, suppose we want to capture people um, who might be at risk of, of COVID and their progression on COVID and influenza as another one, um, as another condition. Uh, these are distinct conditions. A person might be in one situation with respect to COVID and a different situation with respect to influenza. And there might be particular concerns when, for example, a person is infected with both at the same time, or when a person is in you know, a state of, of uh, infection in one and is exposed in the other. Um, and uh, as a result, you know, often we'll want to keep track of simultaneously for parties in the population, what states are they in with respect to each of these. Um, and in a stock flow model, and I have to apologize for, for sort of the, the visual um, um, insult of this, uh, you know, we, we can map out in a grid in the sort of Cartesian product of all possibilities. So, so there's a lot going on here. I wanna parse it out for you. So along the x-axis here, along this sort of top axis, we have progression for COVID from susceptible with COVID, that's S sub C, to exposed with COVID, infected with COVID, and recovered with COVID. That's, that's along this top progression, right? But for each of those states, they could progress for flu. That's vertical, vertical, vertical. Um, so someone could be susceptible for COVID and could be exposed for flu, could be infected with flu, you know, infective with flu, I should say, and recovered with flu. Or they could be exposed to COVID, exposed to flu as well, uh, and infected with flu or recovered with flu. And you, you know, you have this kind of rather uh, prolific, uh, this proliferation of states here um, between the two of them. Um, and as a modeler, um, um, this is readily achieved, but it's somewhat disconcerting. It seems in, in many ways blunt, um, you know, that we have to represent this, all possible combinations of them to, to, to count the number of people or to deal with different dynamics for particular areas of this. And you know, this is not a uncommon thing. So for example, with chronic disease, we often have this, right? So we might have, for example, um, uh, going along here, um, along the y-axis, diabetes progression from no diabetes to asymptomatic to symptomatic to diabetes with complications. More plausibly, this would be pre-diabetes you know, diabetes without complications, diabetes with complications. And then on the, on the x-axis, you might have stages of coronary artery disease and, and extend it out, you know, further. Um, so you might have early stage and late stage or what have you. And, you know, the fact is we, we often have these multiple conditions to which an individual is associated. Sometimes they're health conditions. Sometimes there are other things. Maybe it's progression in age along one axis, infection status in another, and attitudes towards care seeking in a third, for example. Um, but this sort of 
combinatorial um, you know, approach to it um, is, uh, is practical, but I mean, it's, excuse me, it's um, straightforward, but often um, you know, troublingly awkward, um, particularly as we start to get to more dimensions, yeah. Um, and you know, to sort of bring this home through a, a practical model, um, one of our models for um, HPV early on, which drew on a, a model from the literature by El Basha, um, who I think was an advisor at the time. Um, we have representation of males, representation of, of, of females down here, where I, this is human papillomavirus. And so we have a you know, risk of progression onto uh, to cervical cancer captured here. Um, uh, and uh, we have, um, you know, the several several different divisions we're interested in. Uh, different sexes, for sure, um, subdivided male, female, uh, but different cervical screening groups, cervical cancer screening groups, three sexual activity groups because it's spread uh, sexually, uh, two smoking statuses, and you know, each visual visual state variable stock here represents a profusion of, of, of actually distinct underlying stocks, so 408 in this case. Um, and if you look at the equations for this, and if anyone's interested, I'm glad to, to show and tell, what one gets is you know just this amazing sort of sets of, of uh, you know semi-opaque characterization of of rules that are broken out by, by different groups. In this case, age, ethnicity, sexual activity group, cervical screening category, and smoking status. And you can progress along one and progress along another, progress along the third. You know, you can have people aging, you can have them change the sexual activity group, change the cervical cancer screening category, perhaps in response to an intervention, changing smoking status. And it leads to this, again, this unseemly and confusing, awkward, cumbersome progression. And you can only imagine what would happen if we wanted to further distinguish people rural versus urban or, or with respect to their um, care-seeking attitude or what have you, you would you know, trust in the healthcare system. You would end up needing to modify this massive number of characterizations here and potentially add in additional lines of development. So, you know, what we're dealing with with aggregate models, if we want to really grapple with this issue of, of comorbid conditions, but even of just heterogeneity, we're dealing with this proliferation of this combinatorial explosion, this curse of dimensionality with respect to this, this is two dimensions, and we have uh, you know, COVID and flu, but maybe we also want to capture RSV, um, the, the, uh, the, the very common type of, uh, of uh, respiratory disease that makes its appearance every winter. Or maybe we want to characterize you know, some risk factors, including smoking status or what have you. And you go from a square to a cube, a four-dimensional structure, it gets really awkward and, and painful uh, if we want to capture the heterogeneity. So um, um, where are we at with uh, a, an individual level representation? This was aggregate. This was aggregate. This is counting the number of people in these different states, counting the number up. And we have to, we have to keep track of those numbers in these combinations of states. How many here? How many here? How many here? How many here? If this reminds you of this whole challenge we had with static heterogeneity, where we had this sort of situation and counting up the number of all possible combinations, it is good with good reason. Um, because it's the same fundamental issue. Um, where are we at if we represent it individually? If we, instead of counting those up, we just distinguish each individual and have each individual maintain its characteristics, green circle, red square, whatever. Well, 
Um, what we're going to have here is uh, a situation where we could characterize a given individual as having a set of attributes, just like we could with static attributes. Maybe we treat their income as static for this model. Maybe we treat their education level as static. Maybe we treat their ethnicity, uh, of course, as static. Um, perhaps we treat their, uh, or maybe they have a, a province of birth, for example, or birth weight. Those are all static. We just have those as different quantities we maintain. Similarly, we keep track separately of their infection status, their care seeking status, et cetera, as different concerns. And for each of these concerns, we just layer it in. Notice what we're not doing here. This is really important. With aggregate modeling, we had to consider all these combinations because we had to count the number in each of these possibilities. Here, we don't have to do that. We're just keeping track for an individual, what state are they in with respect to infection for that individual? What state are that, is that particular individual in with respect to care seeking? You know, if we add their flu, um, their flu status here as one state chart, their COVID-19 one is another. We don't have to have all combinations in this sort of, this sort of uh, heinous way, um, this cumbersome way. We would just keep track of their flu status and their infection status because we're keeping track of it for this individual. We're not counting all possible combinations. We're just saying, what are they with respect to flu? What are they with respect to COVID? What are they with respect to the care seeking attitude, et cetera? That's a very different sort of approach. We don't get this explosion of different possibilities. We just layer in these possibilities. And it lends itself you know, to, to capturing many conditions, just like we can capture aspects of individual heterogeneity with respect to static attributes um, in a very nimble, sort of uh, straightforward surgical way. It's very localized change. Um, uh, you know, adding in a new dimension here at, requires going and modifying for each of these and adding another dimension yet. Yeah, maybe it's with respect to care seeking attitude coming out of the board. Um, it requires a global change affecting all these flows, all these stocks, um, in short, affecting all this sort of thing. You have to go modify all these different flows and all the stock definitions, all the state variables. Here, we, we have no such thing. I mean, we can add in a state chart uh, with respect to their kidney, kidney health, to coronary heart disease, retinopathy, diabetes. Now, you might recognize that and say, yeah, we can layer this in, but where's the connections? I mean, surely the reason, the motivation that I gave for perhaps keeping track of COVID and flu is because we're concerned about people who are have co-infection, who are simultaneously in, infected with flu and infected with COVID-19. So people are exposed here in either an exposed state for, for exposed state or infected state for, for any combination of them. So, so exposed, exposed, infosed, ex infected, uh, for example, or, or infected, exposed, infected, infected, et cetera. Um, so we wanted to characterize that. Maybe, maybe we're concerned, we're concerned about very high mortality risk and we wanna represent mortality you know, um, there for those or hospitalization burden, right? Um, how do we do that here? Well, it turns out that there are mechanisms for, for specifying interactions here between these um, that are fairly flexible and that allow you to say essentially, when I'm in this state here, um, I want to progress faster along this, this set of transitions. Or if I'm in both these states simultaneously, I want to impose a higher risk of, you know, X. So it wouldn't, in this case, it wouldn't be death, but it could be, right? Um, maybe for end-stage renal disease and diabetes with treatment via insulin, there's some sort of interaction. And we can capture that. We can ask, is this person in both these states simultaneously? If so, they have a higher mortality rate. 
So, so the fact that we specify each of these concerns orthogonally at right angles, separately, distinctly from each other is not, is not prohibiting us from capturing those interactions. It's just allowing us to capture those interactions in a way that highlights the specific interaction without burying it, without submerging it, obscuring it in a welter, a cacophony of different combinations. Here, there may be special rules for infective, infective people or infected, exposed, et cetera, but it's, it's kind of buried in this cacophony, this curse of dimensionality, this cacophony of different combinations, this welter of, of different specific details. Here, if we want an interaction, we can highlight it a little bit more easily um, uh, because it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's not um, buried in this, in this set of all combinations. So parallel state charts, um, for example, uh, if, if that's the, the right way to say it, multiple state charts within an individual provide this extra level of, of, of richness in, in, a, in characterizing progression of individuals uh, with respect to multiple conditions and a scalability, a sort of uh, ease of adding in new concerns um, which is very different from what we see with aggregate stock and bond models, where we are committed to, bound to the strictures of needing to keep track of all combinations. There may be common features. So often, for example, you have a final state that is in common here. So if someone dies, obviously it's gonna bear on their diabetes, tuberculosis and TB use status. Um, in a way that you know would make sense representing death as sort of a, a common uh, a common uh, uh, common feature of all of these. Um, but um, you know it's this ability to kind of layer in concerns that gives this flavor of adding um, adding heterogeneity here. Now I'd like to spend uh, our, some of our remaining time here looking at a few models. And I, I want to I do that partly to, to show you some new features, but also to highlight um, some ways other than state charts, we keep track of state. With the proviso, they're more, a bit more ad hoc. Um, and we, you know, we as HGM-based modelers uh, uh, really, uh, really should develop um, additional mechanisms to capture in a structured, more abstract way. But let's, let's go look at this. So the first thing I want you to do is open up a sample model. And, and I don't know why this name is not showing up here. Uh, give me a second and I will try to remedy this. Um, there we go. And well, okay, the, the, the iconography suffers, but uh, the message is maintained. Um, so I'd like you to open up a predator prey agent base. And this model harks back to my opening comments that some of you may have missed um, on the snowshoe hares and the Canadian lynx um, and, and those populations in records maintained by the Hudson Bay Cor um, Corporation, uh, not far from uh, where I speak. So let's, let's open this up. Um, I suspect uh, the PAW was probably a big center at that time, actually, in terms of the fur trade and, and, and the voyageurs and so on. So let's go open this up here in any logic. So I'm gonna to go to help and example models. And if you, if you go down to, uh, by P, predator, prey, agent based, here it is. Um, so what did I do? I did help example models and I clicked and I, through down to predator prey agent base. So I'm gonna open that up. Um, okay, so predator prey agent based um, illustrates some features of state chart, but with a twist. So let's go take a look. Um, first of all, hares here have a singularly uh, 
austere and, and kind of um, sort of uh, depressingly simple view of the world. <laughs> they're either alive or they're dead. Uh, and, and they can die because of age or being eaten by a lynx. Um, it's kind of a, 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 a grim life. Uh, the beautiful animals, uh, snowshoe hares, um, uh, once in my front yard as I speak, very likely, but um, they are uh, uh, they are subject to predation by lynx. Um, and, and so they have a, a, a simple life and they periodically have babies um, with uh, a certain rate as given by the, the natality, uh, the rate of, of, of giving birth here. Um, okay, um, and when a, when a hare does give birth, Basically, um, it adds hairs in and, uh, and adds it into a new cell. So we're gonna situate these, each of these hairs in uh, a certain cell, um, uh, which, which will locate it in space here, okay? Um, okay, um, beyond that, we're, and we're gonna have a big module on spatial modeling and, and mobility, but also situated agents and which are which are not mobile. And we'll come back to that. But but let's take a look here at links. Links have a state chart which has some additional texture to it, uh, additional twists, as I promised. So here we have uh, what's called a hierarchical state chart. We have an, an overall state chart that indicates they're alive. Um, and uh, and then within it, um, we have a state chart where they can either hunt uh, or and hunt and be successful in hunting, um, uh, or they can, in which case they eat and sort of re-enter the state chart, or they can have no luck and be, you know, back on the prowl again for, for uh, the hares that form their population. And they too live in a set here, okay? Um, now, what I wanted to draw your attention to was this um, hierarchical quantity here, okay? Um, and this is a rather, um, a, a rather sort of creative but simple use of it. Uh, we only have one state within the hierarchical state and um, you know, we come out of it when we've eaten and sort of come back in to, to reinitiate our hunt. Um, or we have we have no no luck here, um, but uh, it depicts the use of this uh, sort of uh, hierarchical state in a way um, that is, you know, hints at its repertoire. And I'm going to show you some additional uses in just a moment, but I'd like you to go run this simulation. And what you'll find is that these hairs and these lengths uh, are placed in space, and we can. Um, they're placed in a sort of uh, uh, two-dimensional area. The, the hairs are, are the green and the links are the red here. And if we were to slow it down, we would see you know, the links uh, uh, engaging in, in some mobility, the hairs as well. The links eat hairs, uh, which are um, geographically proximate to them or spatially proximate to them. And, uh, and the hares give birth, um, and they give birth uh, nearby, as I recall. Um, so uh, lynx give, give birth, they have babies, and so do hares. And um, hares um, uh, basically find a cell around them, which is, is not overpopulated, and, and give birth there. So you get this kind of spatial dynamics and what you see coming out of it is, um, is emergent behavior, high level behavior, which um, is not unlike what we see for natural populations with predator prey. So you have lynx and the lynx populations are fluctuating a little bit, but we have pronounced fluctuations in the prey. Um, and you know, the nature of, of this will differ if we, if we change, for example, the, um, the number of births to which hares give rise uh, in a given year. Um, so here we've essentially changed the, 
the hair birth rate, um, and uh, that can lead to you know, differences uh, within this dynamic. We can also change we can also change the number of hair births um, at a given time. Um, and you may have noticed the lynx population went up as a result. Um, but further, you can you know, change the number of, of lynx births, for example. And what you'll start to see is kind of some added fluctuations for, for lynx populations compared to what we saw originally. So, there's a model exhibiting emergent behavior, um, population dynamics with cycles in them, um, where those cycles are driven by particular assumptions, but complex spatial dynamics involving interactions of lynxes and hares, where the lynx uh, go and, and hunt here um, uh, for uh, a period of time and they're eat, they eat if they find a, a, a hair in their cell here. Um, if there's a, a hair in their cell, they'll, they'll go and eat it. Okay, um, so this is a model exhibiting hierarchical state charts. Um, and I wanna talk just a little bit about those um, because I believe it's a topic which transcends you know, any logic um, uh, specific uh, matters. And I want to want to particularly highlight a, a model built actually for one of my classes by Professor. their projects of chronic wasting disease. Um, here we have um, agents being mule deer, um, and you know we have disease progression. Uh, we have age over here. You know fawn, when they're fawns, when they're adults, and you'll notice the the use of hierarchical state charts in a rather uh, elegant fashion, um, you know, for, for, for animals as a whole that are alive, uh, adults, um, and those that are rendered into carcasses either through, um, well, from, from other causes uh, or, or from chronic wasting disease or from predation, et cetera. Um, Disease progression is also captured in a hierarchical fashion. And I, I wanna draw your attention to um, how this is using the, uh, the language of hierarchical modeling in a rather uh, clever way. So with, or in, a, in an appropriate way, in a suitable uh, way that takes advantage of its, um, of its strengths. So you'll notice that some of the transitions here, for example, the hunting transition, occur from not individual simple states, as they're called, these individual yellow ones, for example, or red ones, or, or magenta, um, but they occur from these hierarchical states. So for example, adults can be hunted, fawns can't. Um, any adult is subject to hunting here, and hence this transition over here on the right from hunting state. Similarly, any animal um, at whatever, whatever season, summer, during rut, winter, et cetera, is, you know, can become, uh, become thirsty. Um, uh, here, um, animals uh, can be in a wandering state uh, or, or, or not. Um, but uh, they can go to food and, and go to water. Um, and, uh, and this ability to articulate these, um, uh, these state charts at a higher level allows us to capture some of these transitions for the whole set of states where it could apply to any of those substates. Thirst, being thirsty, for example, going to water, um, hunting, um, uh, or contact occurring in any of the infectious states uh, over here. It can apply in any of these substates in a rather, in a way that's uh, rather elegant. We don't have to specify contact separately for each of these states, just once for all infectious states. And we can ask in a single go, you know, is this animal infectious without getting into whether they're subclinical shedding or at the clinical level of shedding? Um, we can ask if they're an adult without getting to their exact age, for example. So hierarchical state charts um, provide this extra level of mechanism for 
for capturing abstraction, grouping states that share certain characteristics and critically share certain processes. Um, and we captured that through our transitions here. Um, this is rather different from what we have in a stock and flow model, for example, um, where we, you know, will often have stock and flows um, characterized, but we won't group them hierarchically traditionally. Um, that happens to be one of the areas where we are innovating using categorical approaches, compositional modeling approaches um, right now, but uh, sort of adding hierarchical uh, reasoning like that to stock flows and some other groups have explored this some, but, but it's, rather, um, uh, it's rather empowering to be able to have hierarchical state charts where we can characterize things at any of these different levels, group things together, apply, characterize processes that are shared against uh, uh, several substates. Okay, so, um, um, you know, I, I guess I, I won't go into this uh, in, um, tell you what, I, I'm, since we have a bit of time still, I think I will highlight one other model that is worth looking at in terms of its state charts. And that is a model which um, I asked you to examine before. It's the introductory teaching GDM4 model. And it's, we've downloaded it before. If you've got any logic up, chances are it's already in there or you could load it in. Um, if you don't have it, it's, it's on the Canvas site for the course. And so I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna open up person here. And um, you know, here too, you'll see some use of, of uh, hierarchical state charts to distinguish you know, different types of pregnancy states, but also you know, dynamics from them as a whole and to distinguish uh, multiple types of transitions here. You'll see conditional transitions and these rate-based transitions. Uh, what is notable in this model is how these rate-based transitions are being characterized in a way that their hazard rate of progressing draws on uh, uh, hazard rate ratios uh, as, as um, they might be specified for different characteristics, for birth weight, for obesity, for overweight, in your drug exposure, et cetera. And those govern over time the, the transition here, say from this, from overweight to normal weight, or similarly going from normal glycemic to pre-diabetic. Um, so this follows this sort of form that you might see in survival analysis, for example, with multivariate regressions involving a given transition. Um, and um, it's one of the forms that you might, where you might get rates um, drawing on the literature to introduce uh, for these hazard rates and uh, capture those dynamics uh, in a way that varies with different risk factors as, as shown here. Okay, um, so this is a model you know I wanted you to be uh, aware of, and um, it 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 shows you know state charts of different sorts being used to complement different aspects of an individual situation. You'll notice also with this model are these uh, parameters that I highlighted last time. Um, so this is a model which makes use of heterogeneity in types of concerns, you know, here weight status, here glycemic status, here pregnancy status, uh, and also um, uh, characteristics that are static uh, over time. Relational like mother, continuous like birth time or SES index or birth weight and categorical like, like sex, for example. Um, okay, so I told you that State charts are just one aspect of capturing state. And I wanted, you know, in the final parts of this to, um, to sort of, you know, avoid privileging them throughout the lecture by talking a little bit about, about some of the other ways we maintain state. Um, and, um, some of these ways are more principled than others. Um, we're gonna see 
you know, different, uh, different styles of, of doing so. So uh, one way would be uh, uh, to capture uh, dynamics in, in or state in variables. So for example, there's this count gestational diabetes episodes here. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, um, when an individual um, develops a, a new case of dysglycemic pregnancy here, they enter this dysglycemic pregnancy state, their count of gestational diabetes episodes will rise. That's what that plus plus means. And we actually keep track of it at, a indivi at an individual level, that is for, for this uh, variable here. Um, or, or at the, the overall main level, um, at the level of the whole population. So when someone comes in here, we, we keep track of the state. That's an aspect of, of their state. Um, if, if people transition in weight, we keep track of the hazard rate that applies for this other state chart, their, their uh, mortality risk is affected by their level of of, of weight. Um, so they have a different mortality risk um, that applies in each of these weight status, uh, stati, and that, that ends up um, affecting their probability of transitioning to the, to the death state here. Um, that death state could have been shared between all of these. But this is an aspect in a way of their state. It's also used to communicate from this state chart to this one um, in a way that might be useful. Um, so those are some ways of, of characterizing um, state uh, other than per se state charts. When we come into a state in a state chart, maybe we affect some of these, for example, but we keep them outside of a state chart because we're, they're counts and we don't want a state chart for every possible count. A, you know, state a state for every possible count in a state chart. Let's look at um, one other model, which I also provided to you, which we've explored before, which is this uh, GIS food environment version six. And so I'm, I'm just going to go there. And if you have it, you can call it up. But I just want to highlight, you know, here, for example, we have a count of supermarket meals remaining for a given person and a count of convenience store meals um, that are that are remaining for that person. And you know, eating a meal, for example, leads them to engage in a process by which they will consume one of these meals. So here, once again, we are using variables in any logic, these sort of factors, to keep track of this information instead of directly um, having them be altered by a state chart, it's really this event which fires periodically um, three times per day on average, a certain hazard rate of three times per day. And, and that ends up affecting their decision-making and their consumption of the meals in their larder. Um, so um, we're keeping track here of state and mechanisms other than state charts. And we're affecting that state outside of state charts in this case. We're affecting it through other mechanisms. So variables, keeping track of, of state and variables is, is something we use here. I should note that this eat meal um, procedure, this is actually not keeping track of state. It, it, it represents sort of an instantaneous decision process whereby they decide what to do. It has an effect, but there's no state maintained. But there is one other thing staring us in the face, and it was present in the other model, and it's present here. And um, it needs to be used with caution, and we'll be talking about that in a future lecture. But, you know, it's emblematic of what we, how we use uh, hybrid modeling. And that is keeping track of continuous elements of state. Here are their weight in kilograms, for example, according to a stock and flow model. And you know, in other cases, we might have a stock and flow model for something like their immune 
system activation level against uh, a given um, against a given pathogen, or it might be uh, represent their uh, tolerance level for a certain type of narcotic. Let's suppose for you know oxycontin, um, their ability for their liver to process it efficiently, which is a key mediating factor for overdoses. Um, uh, there could be uh, stock and flow models uh, associated with changes in, in insulin level or glucose level at the more finer grained uh, sphere or, or stress levels or perceptions of a given factor on another or opinions on a given subject. Stock and flow models often have a lot of theory to them. And here we're applying it at an individual level within each person person here, we have this dynamics characterized by the stock and flow. This is not an aggregate stock flow model, it's an individual level stock flow model from the perspective of population members. Um, it's aggregate for the population, you know, from a, a, bi a biomedical perspective, of course, and, and, and keeping track of weight um, at, a, at a more aggregate level. So stock and flow models do provide another way of keeping track of weight, but one with, with quite high performance costs um, and prolific performance costs if they're not used uh, with, with some basic mechanisms um, for, for this particular package. But state for an individual um, can be captured with state charts, particularly for categorical state or nominal state where you're you're going between states that are defined, um, you know, as categories. Uh, it can be kept track of for variables, for quantities that are continuous or so large to be con considered continuous, like the count of meals remaining, and where it doesn't make sense to characterize a, a state chart. Um, it can be characterized uh, in a continuous way with great caution by something that's conceptually a stock and flow model uh, characterizing dynamics. Those are not the only ways we can characterize states, but they're some of the bigger ones. Um, and you know, they do provide a repertoire for, for agent-based modeling that is considerably larger than what we have with, uh, with traditional stock and flow modeling. So um, I'm going to go now and, and I've given you, you know, a bit of guidance. It was just uh, with respect to any logic, but you'll find me, you know, giving many other lectures uh, on that subject. But I really want to go to, to sort of reflect on some of the things we've learned in this module last time and this time with respect to this issue of individual level models and heterogeneity. Um, Models, ladies and gentlemen, that are formulated in an individual level, such as an agent-based model, um, can, can offer many advantages when it comes to capturing static or dynamic heterogeneity. And I've tried to boil down my comments into six bullet points here, okay? Um, one that I've emphasized in the last half hour a lot is the ability to keep track of and track over time the state of a single individual along multiple dimensions. Okay. Um, and uh, so progression along diabetes, progression along heart disease, progression along COVID 19 status, flu status. Um, when we're characterizing things at an individual level, we can characterize what state a given person is in without dealing, needing to deal with all possible combinations of states. And it, it's very scalable and it allows us to capture that added information very readily. Um, model transparency benefits because it is scalable. We forego the need, we, we, we eliminate the need to consider all these combinations these sort of hideous combinations here um, that obscure um, what's really going on in the model. They, 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 they obscure in a cacophony, a welter of details, the heart of the matter, logic. Um, 
And instead, in, a, in an individual-based model, we can capture more transparently the basic logic of the situation. It's far from perfect, particularly when interactions between state charts, it can, it can get you know, hidden in the whole thing, but it's, uh, it's a lot better than often the curse of dimensionality, which blows up as we add more heterogeneity. And in general, we could you know, sort of more nimbly add, <coughs> excuse me, heterogeneity into a model. Um, adding in heterogeneity um, into a model is a local operation. We add in a parameter or we add in a state chart. We don't have to combine it with every pre-existing state chart or, or, or consider all possible combinations of parameter values. And because of that, we can capture continuous heterogeneity, discrete heterogeneity, and relational heterogeneity. By relational, I mean relationships between agents, for example. Um, continuous uh, heterogeneity, my current weight, um, my current immune system activation level, um, for example, um, uh, my level of tolerance to oxycontin. We can cap capture that um, as an aspect of continuous heterogeneity. Discrete heterogeneity, no problem either. Um, states and state charts or someone's sex or someone's ethnicity or what have you. Um, uh, country of birth. Um, but we can also capture these relational ones. Who's my mother, who's my father, who are my siblings, et cetera. Um, I, I emphasized at one point memory full transitions, this idea of allowing us to capture transitions that are not memoryless. Um, it's not merely that we can capture transition, the chance of leaving over time of, as a whole for the model. We can do that with memoryless processes. But here we can capture transitions whose likelihood of occurring depends on how long I've been in the state. And, and you know, the, the most patent example of this is a timeout transition, but we can have that chance per unit time of leaving depend on how long I've been quit as a smoker, you know, my chance of, of falling back into smoking. And the final thing I'll say, um, and one I think is underplayed, um, is capturing uh, history information or what, what I like to call, and Jeff McDonald likes to call biography for a given agent. By virtue of being able to track multiple dimensions of an individual, we can record a record, a transcript as it were, of their, their state, their situation, um, the factors that have affected them over time. And, um, and that's really important because there's many types of data we have from the world that may be longitudinal in character at an individual level. So for example, data from the world about um, you know, observations from a follow-up study over time. Maybe it's long COVID observations for a given person via our, our long COVID study via smartphones. Maybe it's uh, immunological observations for the same individuals. Uh, maybe it's aspects associated with, um, you know, reoffending uh, of an individual over time, or hot spotting, which spots the fact that, you know, twenty percent of users of the ER use eighty percent of the resources by representing many times, or complex patients are more likely to come in because they can't get the care they need in the community. We have lots of data from health systems, from longitudinal studies. Um, that is accumulated over time for an individual. Even things like social media data that we may have for posting of an individual is over time. And that sort of data is a premier significance in trying to understand evolution of people over time. It's, it's one of the most central ways that we can inform our understanding of the dynamics of the system as they govern particular individuals. And it is an unfortunate irony, an unfortunate uh, limitation of stock and flow models at an aggregate level that while it gives us something that is a longitudinal portrait at a collective level, we can keep track of how many people at a given time are susceptible, exposed, infected, or recovered. Um, 
and, and ask that at any given time. Maybe we find 100 people now when we look again next year and we find another 100 people are there um, at the beginning of next year. But we can't really reason about in general whether they're the same 100 people. We can't ask about the experience of an individual. You know, maybe it's 1% of the population that's waning immunity and coming back and getting infected and 99% are not. Um, we can't really express that with an aggregate model very effectively. Um, we can do it in very, very limited circumstances, reason about memoryless processes, but our hands are really quite tied. We can't keep track how many times a given individual has been infected or even readily the number of times people across the population, the distribution of times people have been infected. This just, even though it's aggregate, we can't readily compute that. Uh, we can't readily calculate that. This gives us over time cross-sectional depictions of the population. How many people are in each of these states? It does not give us a picture of the, the change over time at an individual level and does not allow us to compute statistics to compare with that sort of information. By contrast, with individual level formulations, we can accumulate that information. We can have statistics on the number of times people have gotten infected in the population, compare them against you know, uh, population statistics. We could calibrate it to that. We can test our understanding, um, test the plausibility of the model, et cetera. So this ability to accumulate history information is of great significance for practical modeling. And it is enabled by this ability to track individuals at um, as they progress over time, readily support in individual le level modeling and not notably in compartmental modeling at an aggregate level. So um, this was a bit of a, a reflection of what we've learned in this module. Heterogeneity and the ability to represent heterogeneity uh, is much more, uh, uh, is much better, much more easily embraced with agent-based modeling. But remember, you know, we, we want to be cautious and careful and proceed in a stepwise fashion because we can add this in so readily um, if we can get ahead of ourselves and add too much in and obscure our understanding. We need to let our understanding emerge over time in the modeling process by adding things in bit by bit, running the model, learning from it, et cetera. Okay. That's all we have time for today. Um, I, of course, uh, will hold office hours now. And um, I, I do need to apologize for people. Um, uh, I, um, I, I have a queue, which I've been working through, of requests about this course. Um, been answering them. But um, today and tomorrow are sort of peak madness for me. Um, but um, uh, starting after tomorrow, I'll be able to respond a little bit more, more freely. But uh, I appreciate your patience while I just uh, deliver on some, some obligations and some talks. Uh, I gave one this morning and, and two more tomorrow, and uh, then should be back in action for more freely answering emails and, uh, and um, addressing the needs of this course. One other thing, I am um, going to be asking people uh, in this course for a bit of guidance on um, how much uh, um, how much you'd like in terms of tutorials on particularly practical model building using uh, using agent based platforms um, it is the sort of thing where you know I could I, I can give certainly a lot of assistance on the age-based modeling side. I could walk people through some features of NetLogo, another great package. Uh, I could talk about Repast um, and, uh, and, and speak some about ModGen or other packages, OpenM. So if, if there is interest in this, I'm going to um, you know, try to make sure that I can address those needs for this course. I don't think I'll do that right now, but I will send out, I think, a poll where I will ask for feedback on that and see what supports I can get as people get into the projects. So thank you very much. And I will shift now to office hours. Thank you.